Suspect Convictions is sponsored by Hollywood and Crime. Explore episode one with us and subscribe to Hollywood and Crime on iTunes, Stitcher, Wondery.com, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Today's sponsor is Audible, with an unmatched selection of audiobooks, original audio shows, news, comedy, and more. Get a free audiobook with a 30-day trial at audible.com slash suspect. The streetlights come on, it's getting dark. She's supposed to be home before the streetlights come on. She wasn't home yet, so I'm thinking she's just out there playing with a friend. She never came home. She should be playing with a friend. She should be going to school and enjoying herself. You know, not strangled, murdered, and uh, treated like a piece of garbage. Seeing her laying there smoldering is tore you up. It's one of those cases that never leave you. And Stanley's making sure of that. There's no doubt whatsoever in my mind or heart that they have the right man. He looked at and or processed 10,000 items of evidence and never found anything that connected Jennifer and Stanley. I mean, I like cheese, but I'm not a rat. I like kids, but not like that. You're listening to Suspect Convictions, a podcast from WBIK and Scott Reader. I'm Lacey Scarmana. This week, Scott Reader sat down with a panel of guests to talk about the Stanley Liggins case. He was joined by former Scott County attorney Bill Davis, who prosecuted Stanley Liggins' first two trials, Stanley Liggins' second defense attorney Mike Toby, and Aphrodite Jones, the New York Times best-selling author of Cruel Sacrifice and host of the television show True Crime with Aphrodite Jones. Here's their conversation. One of the questions that comes to my mind, Mike, is uh, when we've talked in the past, you said you think that Joe Glenn, um, Jennifer's stepfather, was somehow involved in the murder. Could you explain why you think that? Well, I, I do think that it's at least plausible that he was involved in it. And um, there's not much good you can say for Ace, his nickname. It's it's just one of those circumstances where it, it's just a plausible thing to believe what I have suggested anyway it, that he is likely to have handed her over to people of whom he was afraid and indebted to whom he was indebted as uh, anything. So, you know, I don't have any hardcore evidence, um, primarily circumstantial evidence. His accessibility his personality, his, his weaknesses, and his uh, kind of cover aces ass no matter what it takes uh, lifestyle. You said when we talked earlier that you had a very odd experience when you were cross-examining Ace uh, in the courthouse in Dubuque um, where some men came into the courtroom during the cross-examination. Yeah. Tell I me did. about that. There were two very large, by that I'd say 6'4", maybe even a little more than that. Um, And both of them had uh, very uh, liberal and uh, I'd say unusual tattoos on their faces. And um, they came in approximately halfway through Bill's a direct exam, and they left immediately after my cross exam. And um, you know, to me, they were exactly the kind of people by look, anyway, who would have been involved in the drug business as well as being violent enough to have participated in the death of a little girl, the way she died. I guess one of the questions that comes to mind on that, um, Mike, is, I mean, why do you think they were there? I think they were there to intimidate and to make sure they knew what was said. That begs the question, if they're there to intimidate Ace, what are they trying to intimidate him from saying or not doing? 
Well, that I can't tell you because I would never ex- have expected Ace to uh, all of a sudden break down in tears and and confess whatever might have been his involvement. But if I were in their shoes and I didn't trust Ace, which wouldn't be a shocker, then uh, I would probably make sure I was around when the risk was there. Okay. Bill, do you think it's possible that he had a, had a role in the mix? I don't get to deal in possibilities. I get to deal with real evidence and what I'm able to, with the rules to produce. But uh, he was Joe was the first person we looked at. Ace, and whatever Mike says about Ace is probably true. He is the poster child for no good Nick. He truly was. And um, we did everything we could or we checked every way we could to see if he was connected, and we found no, truly no connection. You know, one of the questions that I keep getting emails from people all over the world about is, what was his alibi? How, how do we know that he wasn't there at the scene, that sort of thing? I thought you probably Tra- would. Transportation, for one thing, and um, he didn't have a way to get there. He didn't have a way to get to Rock I- or to Davenport from Rock Island. Um uh, Primarily, that was it. it, it my, as Mike says, you know, he's, that's his daughter. He's in the same household with her. But at, once she leaves, we don't have any connection. We have Joe riding around on a bicycle for a while and then riding around in someone else's car, supposedly looking for her. And uh, Mike was... He couldn't have gotten a ride to this location not that far from his home. Yeah, with a little uh, girl on fire or a little girl? I mean, I don't know. I'm saying before the girl went on fire. So you're, I'm, yeah, we're all able to speculate that this poss- there's another possibility, but uh, we have. Well, I'm just saying there's no alibi for Joe Glenn. Yes, there and is. And it's a short distance from his home um, to where his stepchild was murdered. No, that's not true. There is a Mississippi River in between the two. What's there? There's several what miles. It? We don't know where she was killed. In fact, that was one of the. Uh, that was a proof problem. Yeah, for a problem and actually a, a statutory and constitutional issue that was raised, the jurisdictional mystery, so to speak. No, no, I, and I understand jurisdictional mysteries. I mean, you know, I've been doing crime reporting and crime writing for 25 years, and I understand many times, actually, people deliberately uh, put a body in a different state or a different county so that it does create a jurisdictional quagmire so that the crime is more difficult to solve. And I mean, I'm sure you guys have encountered that more than once in your careers. Um, have, but but my, my concern or my, my interest in this alibi question, to answer Scott's uh, question, my interest in about, about this alibi it comes directly from what the appellant uh, brief says, when, which was filed, you know, uh, in Scott County, um, and this appeal particularly refers to the travel times between the scene of the fire and Glenn's house. And, and Joe Glenn's house, apparently, a Davenport police officer testified in that 1995 jury trial that he timed the drive from the scene of the fire to the Glenn house, and it took six minutes and eight seconds. That's not a very long drive. I mean, there may be a river there, but via car, six minutes and eight seconds, and if, if the rate was slightly faster, that's just at legal speeds, it was also only going to take five minutes and eight seconds. So basically a five- or six-minute drive, if you want to drive real perfectly with the speed limit, a seven-minute drive, it is not a big leap to think that he could have gotten a ride there and back with somebody if, in fact, as you are kind of insinuating, that he might have had two biker friends who could have been partners in this. I mean, I know it's speculation, but... Exactly, and we deal in evidence and facts. We don't deal in speculation. I know you're quoting an appellate brief as factual. It's not. It's an argument. But isn't it true, sir, that the, the drive between those two locations was timed out yes at, it was and we put that into evidence six minutes eight seconds 
Something to that effect, yes. It's not a I'm great... I'm just asking because do, I've you, done drives like that to try to understand whether or not a defendant would be guilty or innocent. I've actually taken the drives myself along the way in, in my own investigation. So when that's something that's quoted in an appellate brief, to me, that's not a question. That's a statement of fact. Well, there's no, there's no argument about the, the uh, short period of time that it takes for the drive of course, that doesn't add in the uh, placement of, a, of the body as well as uh, dousing and igniting. Yeah. Uh, the other thing is that the corroboration of ACE was extraordinarily vigorous from mother. And, uh, and we're supposed to believe a mother? I mean, I'm just curious about... You know, a mother being the alibi for for her ne'er do well son. Well, no, 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 oh, no, 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 whoa! Her, you didn't read the whole uh, transcript. Jennifer. This is this is her this Good is point. her stepfather. This is this is her husband, not her son. Oh, you're talking about Sherry Glenn. Yeah. Right. And, oh, and, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Of well, he was the stepfather, not the father. I mean. Right. He was the stepfather. Yes, Sherry Glenn did a lot to try to uh, give him an alibi. I know that. Right. In fact, the other question I have is that there was a witness who saw on television fu funeral footage of Joe Glenn wearing a long fringe black leather jacket, as I'm sure you're well aware, a long fringe black leather jacket with tassels that had some kind of silver studs on it. And a witness later called in about that footage. And in fact, it was interesting that in the rebuttal in the 1995 retrial, both Joe and Sherry offered testimony to show that Joe had pawned this black leather jacket with the long fringes and that it was in pawn until February of 1991 so that in the time period, uh, you know, with, with which this crime happened, he couldn't have possibly been wearing that jacket and he couldn't have possibly, even at the funeral, been wearing that jacket. But... It didn't turn out to be provable either that he did pawn it. I mean, it's not exactly. It's not provable that he pawned it because there was no pawn slip. It was just a, a corroborating testimony from someone else. I'm I'm going to cut in here just to give some context really quick that this witness that Aphrodite is referring to is a woman named Roberta Cadera who testified that on the night of Jennifer Lewis's murder, she was driving by Jefferson Elementary School. She says she saw a man with long hair wearing a leather jacket running from a fire into some nearby woods. She said the leather jacket had tassels and silver studs. And this testimony launched a contentious courtroom debate over whether the stepfather, Joseph Ace Glenn, had a leather jacket in his possession. Obviously, Sherry Glenn, the mother, doesn't want to believe that her husband would have killed his stepdaughter. But I, I just, you know, and of course she'll do anything to defend her husband in the face of a possible allegation of murder. But why would she go to so much trouble to say that this man did not have and was not wearing this black fringed leather jacket when, in fact, the funeral footage was pulled by the, from the news and he was, in fact, wearing not only a black fringe jacket, but it had the silver metal studs on it that the woman had seen and, and, and claimed that this is the same jacket that somehow Glenn was wearing at the time. So I, I just, I don't understand that. You get to the bottom of a trial or the end of a trial, and there's lots of things that don't, you don't understand. These people don't deal in deep logic. I and mean, you talk about taking the body from one jurisdiction to another to make it more complicated, you don't know these people. You don't think they did that, and anyone did that? I don't think these people are intellectually able. Uh-huh. Well, I, I, you know them better than I do. I, I, Unfortunately, I and as Mike... I Bill that I don't think that uh, Sherry, first Sherry would have participated, of course, but I don't think that Ace would know anything about uh, jurisdiction and why it might be handy other than just some basic short distance. I guess one of the questions, this bothers me a little bit, and, you know, I've covered, been a reporter for 30 years, and I've done a lot of different things, but this still bothers me. I know you never have saints testifying in criminal cases, or rarely have saints testifying, but two of the critical people in this case um, have changed their story a little bit um, in the years since. I mean, uh, we have the fellow um, 
who was a cellmate of Stanley Liggins, he now says that he was pushed to to testify with a threat of um, being charged with um, um, being charged with accessory to murder after the fact. He, that's what he's saying now. You said that that is absolutely positively false. I'm not saying he didn't say that to you, but yes. I know he knows the well, the law as well as you do, and he knows there is no charge that he said he's threatened with. Okay, so what I, what I'm hearing from you from our earlier t- talk is. He was never threatened with anything like that. Well, I, no, I don't believe he was. And I think he would have told me if indeed there was that. Or, I, in, you know, that's just me thinking that. But I have absolutely no knowledge of anything like that occurring. And this Frank Rising is not the easiest guy in the world to get along with. And he is, he speaks his mind. Ask Mike. Yeah. I mean, I, and I've, and I've, interviewed Frank in person, and he's an intimidating individual. I mean, he's somebody who freely talks about having stabbed people in prison and done bad things. I mean, I guess but what bothers me about it is you have somebody here who you're saying is not being truthful about why he testified. And, uh, and when you have somebody like that who's maybe lying now or was lying, how do you know he wasn't lying then? I mean, it's like it's the it's, it, personal integrity is what you what oh, you come to. Oh, really? And then Mike, didn't you tell the jury about how many felonies he'd been convicted of and why they should doubt his veracity? Yeah, I did. He he, he was pretty well raked over on cross examination, but in my experience, and I think Bill would agree with me, it's amazing how rarely that really um, affects a jury's belief of a, a snitch. It's, it's disturbing how easily they adopt the testimony of snitches. But, um, yeah, I would say I was able to work him over pretty well and even got him a little bit uh, angry and, and showed, showed his colors, so to speak, a little bit. But it just had no impact. He is the kind of person who would do anything if it would benefit him. That's, there's no doubt about that. But uh, I, I don't uh, believe that he could be intimidated if there were other charges, potential, that had nothing to do with the Ligon's case, of course, that, that he could have uh, um, suffered from. But he wasn't promised anything, this, this snitch, right? Well, well, that's what he says. Well, he was, he, when I interviewed him this time around, he gave an indication, maybe not a full statement, but an indication that maybe he got sent to a nicer prison in the. In a, but there was never any proof of that. No, it just just him telling me that um, a few weeks ago. Fact, by the way, that would have been after. I, I can tell you the other thing is that, uh, and again, I it's not Bill style to do this, so it wouldn't have been offered by Bill, but. The talk around among defense lawyers who later ended up representing him was that he claimed he had a pass on some stuff. So in other words, he had an incentive that was not written and and was understood, wink, wink, to to testify? Wink. I'm the only one in this jurisdiction who had the authority to give him a pass or to give him any future break as long as in this jurisdiction. And I can't believe he thought he was getting a pass for... Illinois or across the state of Iowa, and I didn't give it to him. Okay, fair enough. Right. That's, I hope that was clear from the preface of what I said. So, the, so there's nothing, I, Bill, would it be fair to say there's nothing to his assertion or his hint that he might have gotten sent to a nicer facility because of his testimony against Stanley Liggins? You know, I can't say that there, that's absolutely true. I don't know. Okay. I mean, where he went after that? I have no idea. He and went to Rockwell City rather than Fort Madison. Okay, but that's to... up to the Department of Corrections. So. And believe me, Michael, from his days as a prosecutor, will tell you, they hang up on us when we call them and ask them or tell them what we want them to do. Okay, so nothing to that. No, Corrections runs their own show. Okay. Well, you know, as we talk about this, and I want to make it clear that what I think out, and you know I think this because of the way I've talked about um, the um, 
police reports that I didn't get and uh, some other things, um, the uh, compensated, possibly compensated witness for this case, but frequently compensated for many things that I have felt that officers did things that made a difference that had nothing to do with Bill and that Bill didn't know about. Okay, and that happens. And uh, it, uh, that is my, my great overview of a case, frankly, is that uh, the Bill put on an honest prosecution, but he probably was not always given the honest information to work with. Folks, I've discovered a terrific podcast. It's called Hollywood and Crime. It is about a period in history that absolutely fascinates me, the 1940s, during World War II. It's about a series of murders that happened in Los Angeles. Now, we've all heard about the Black Dahlia, the woman named Elizabeth Short who was sawed in half and found by the police. and It's one of the biggest unsolved mysteries in the United States. But what I never knew until I started listening to this podcast is there was a series of murders of young women all across um, the L.A. area. And the acting in this podcast is phenomenal. It's a docudrama. The production is superb. I think if you like true crime, you're just going to absolutely love Hollywood and crime. It's just a great listen. If you're interested... Just subscribe to Hollywood and Crime on iTunes, Stitcher, Wondery.com, or wherever you listen to podcasts. So again, folks, I highly recommend Hollywood and Crime. Aphrodite, have you run across, you've been uh, covering uh, crime for a long, long time. 25 uh, years. 25 years, counting. yeah. Mm-hmm. Um have you run across that, those sort of th- uh, things, those, the assertion that Mike's making um, in any cases you've covered, that the police were withholding evidence and they were doing some things, uh, uh, had a paid police informant uh, who was testifying, but they never disclosed that, those sort of things. I mean, have you run across that? I've run across that all the time. I mean, that's a, that's a, a, a you know, uh, something that we see in many, many wrongful conviction cases. And, and frankly, I mean, it's... Oftentimes, trials, as I see them, are like a game of chess. And with, with, with all due respect to, to any prosecutor, the objective is to win. And especially in a high-profile case such as this, where a little girl was burned and murdered, uh, the pressure from the public to, to solve it, as you well have noted before, is great, tremendous. And in any case, any criminal case where there's a murder, there is a need on the part of the prosecution to win that case, to put somebody behind bars. And if, in fact, there's evidence that is exculpatory that doesn't have to be handed over or somehow isn't handed over, certainly I've seen that in other cases before. And usually that comes out when there are uh, appeals and new trials granted. And that's when suddenly evidence that hadn't been seen before starts to appear. And I know in this case, as I recall, early on, back in the early 90s, um, there was no signing for evidence, uh, signing for discovery. And so perhaps some reports and, and you know, uh, depositions, transcripts were not given to the defense. Um, that allegation has been made, and I think substantiated that there were 78 reports that were later found um, that had been not handed over to the defense. Whether or not that was a mistake, an accident, or in fact um, a, 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 an effort on the part of prosecution, whether it not be the DA but somebody working within that office, um, it's not uncommon, certainly not uncommon. Seen it many times. We work in a small office, and we had an open file policy. Defense could come in at any time, and often did, 
and review what I have. They were supposed to get a copy of everything we had. And after but that, they didn't, just right? can you, I, no, wait a minute. There was a finding that they didn't. And I'll accept that as a finding. But everything in my office went to the defense. Now, what I'm going to say is that has been changed. It was too loose a policy because of the small prosecutor. We knew the defense lawyers, they knew us. Now every piece of paper is signed for so that we know. And that's been corrected because of this case. But I never hit a file in my life. You know, see, my, my, uh, the reason that uh, you hear me speak in defense of Bill is that uh, I think we're very close. And uh, I guess, number one, I don't think Bill would do that. Number two, I especially don't think he would do it to me. And that's, uh, I've done many cases, uh, I don't know how many murder trials we've done together against each other, and uh, I've, I've never had that kind of thing happen. Well, I'm only going by the what, I, what has been reported, and what's been reported is that there were 78 uh, alleged police reports containing exculpatory evidence, 78 police reports that were, were not given to the defense. And, and that's an awful large number of police reports to not be given to the defense, whether it was because they didn't come into the office to look at them, whether it was because there was this open system where nobody had to sign for anything. I, I don't know why this happened, but it did happen, according to everything that's been reported on this case. Am I wrong? Well, I, well that's, I believe that's true. I, well, I know it's true. I never saw them. Um, I didn't know about them actually until, well, until the appellate decision, the last one came out. To tell you the truth, you know, seventy-eight's a big you number. Know, but how many, how many boxes did you get, man. Mike? The file was humongous. Oh yeah, it was a good foot tall. Mm. So, I, I guess what I'm hearing from Mike is he's not saying that the, the prosecution hid the reports. He thinks that the uh, police may have hid the reports from the prosecution and the defense. Is that what I'm hearing from you, Mike? Yeah. Okay. That's what I think. So you know, but are you they, saying that the police were withholding these reports from the DA on purpose? Yeah. Yes. There are, I can guarantee you, there have been police officers in uh, the Danport Police Department who did things to benefit Bill's cases that he never asked them to do, he never necessarily uh, had a reason to know what they had done. But what would be the motivation of police to hide these reports from the DA? Because they don't, because they were looking to uh, solve the case with tunnel vision? That's the only thing I can think. Yeah. Well, you can look at it that way. They, they, they extracted uh, weak areas, things that would help the defense. Police officers do that. Let me ask you this, uh, Bill. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that the jury's never going to hear in this case. And, you know, they're, not, they're never going to hear that Stan, unless Stanley happens to take the stand and they, they can impeach him. They're never going to hear that he, that he served time in Mississippi for armed robbery. They're never going to hear that a month before um, Jennifer disappeared that um, he was arrested for um, sexually abusing another nine-year-old girl. They're never going to hear um, that he was acquitted for murder uh, in, uh, in the stabbing of another inmate in prison. They're not going to hear a lot of things about his background. Does that bother you at all? Uh, no, not at all. He should be convicted on the evidence, not because he's a no-good Nick. Okay, okay. So I, I guess what I get from a lot of people who have listened to this podcast and email me is, well, why are we even talking about this case? It sounds like he's just a, uh, a really no good guy, and he's done a lot of bad things. And you know, and it's like, well, Mike, would you fill in there? Well, I, I uh, <laughs> you know, I've represented an awful lot of people that uh, I, not only would I not have them home to dinner, I wouldn't even allow them to cross the sidewalk into my yard um, without holding a forty-five auto in my hand. I, I just I think the answer to the question as to why uh, people are 
so interested in this and, and why we are focusing and looking at this case is because there is not one shred of evidence linking Mr. Liggins to Jennifer's murder. And, you know, uh, there were thousands of comparisons of hairs and fibers taken from his car, his room, um, nothing in his Peugeot, nothing in his hotel room, motel room was, was determined by a criminalist to, to have any trace that could have come from Jennifer or her clothing. And, you know, this, this uh, conviction basically links Mr. Wiggins to a crime because I guess somebody uh, identified him from a mugshot photo? No. Um, they identified a taillight um, from the scene is, a, is a, I think, what you're referring to. Well, no, I'm looking at... Uh, after seeing a mugshot photo of Mr. Liggins and news stories about the investigation, um, it was Antonio Holmes okay, went that's to correct. police, and he identified through a through a uh, photo, a mugshot. He identified this this one Stanley Liggins. So it was it was a after it had been been uh, you know on the news, and uh, this person came forward. Other than that alleged eyewitness testimony that he saw Mr. Wiggins standing outside the liquor store the evening of September 17th, um, and he picked Liggins out of a photo lineup, there's, there's nothing else linking uh, Liggins to this, this murder. And in fact, this Antonio Holmes later, who was intoxicated, later came back and said that he had been intoxicated and he couldn't even be sure that it was Mr. Liggins that he saw outside the liquor store. So I, I just think the, the, the strand that the uh, police are hanging on to to convict and, and hold accountable uh, for murder, this, this Stanley Liggins, is, is very weak, very weak. Well, let me, let's let Bill respond. I can tell he's about to jump out of his seat um, wanting to respond here. Well, the case isn't as familiar to me as it would have been years ago either. So my, but you're, are you forgetting about the two women sitting on their porch, seeing Stanley in that red Peugeot and having this little girl walk up and talk to him for a little bit? Are you forgetting I, no, that one? I, I had forgotten about that. There were two women who did test. Very credible that, women. But- yeah, the, 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 yeah, there was no reason to think they would make something up that at least connected them to the extent that they believed that they saw Jennifer uh, talk to Stanley in the car. Now, obviously, that's not necessarily evidence of uh, guilty behavior. It's uh, evidence of the fact that uh, they apparently knew each other or uh, were at least in each other's general presence uh, after she left the house. At, at the end of the day, what does that prove? He was the last person to be seen with her in public? That's all it proves. It's a circumstantial case. I, I understand. It's okay, circumstantial, so but all I'm of it, you have to weigh it all. Cer- if you take any one piece of it, it means nothing. When you but put what it other up, pieces are there, sir? Well, I tried this case twice. I don't know what to take us, Mike, a week or two, uh, 10 days right. or something. There is, Mike wouldn't have lost a case if that's all I had. Okay. Mm-hmm. But you also had the, the testimony from the, um, the woman who said she saw uh, taillights. So. And we also had the woman who saw the gas can in the back seat of the Peugeot. Yeah, of course, I always figured that that was BS because I have a gas can in the trunk of my car right now. And the argument about him um, spraying out of the car wash to get all of the uh, trace evidence as well as any gasoline residue out of there was also BS because there was no evidence that there was residue of commercial detergent in the vehicle. Let me ask you this, Mike, or excuse me, Bill. Um, both Mike, Mike and Julie Walton trained under you, and in a lot of jurisdictions, I mean, I, I know this from covering it, and I've heard this from a lot of experienced defense attorneys, when a case like this comes up after um, 26, 27 years, 
and it's going to you have to do a retrial. A lot of places they'll end up um, pleading it out for time served or something like that. That's not happening here. And what do you think their motivations are? Do you think what drives them? First of all, I don't think Stanley will take a plea. Mm -hmm. I really don't. But what's the benefit to the state, to the people? Uh, he would be time served and loose. Yeah. We could, they could just decide not to retry it then, whatever, if that's, if that's your goal in life. Yeah. Yeah. But they're, no. But, they're, but uh, what I'm hearing from you is you think they're driven by the desire to protect the community. You no, know, all of you folks keep saying driven. Okay. You try the cases that come in and that you think that you can prove to a jury beyond a reasonable doubt. There was no pressure on me, and I don't believe there's any pressure, especially less now, against uh, our pressure on Mike and Julie to be trying the case. I don't see the community pressure. I don't see a whole lot of community interest. I guess I, maybe driven wasn't the right word, but what compels them is a desire for justice in this case. Is that a, It's doing your job. It's doing your job. Okay. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, more with Scott Reeder, Bill Davis, Mike Toby, and Aphrodite Jones. You had a birthday this week, Scott. What did your wife end up getting you? Well, this week she got me headphones so I can listen to Audible. I love listening to books. It makes downtime in the car and when I'm working out, when I'm doing all kinds of things, so much more productive because I can listen to a book and learn something and entertain myself. You know, today when I drove up from Springfield to work in the studio, I listened to The Night Stalker, The Life and Crime of Richard Ramirez. So if you like true crime, and I'm betting the folks who listen to this do because they're listening to suspect convictions, I highly recommend listening to Audible. And better yet, because you listen to suspect convictions, you get a free audiobook if you just sign up for a 30-day free trial. Just go to www.audible.com slash suspect. That's it. Once again, www.audible.com slash suspect, and you can get a free audiobook. You're listening to Suspect Convictions. This week, Scott Reeder sat down with former prosecutor Bill Davis, Stanley Lincoln's second defense attorney Mike Toby, and special guest Aphrodite Jones, the New York Times bestselling author of Cruel Sacrifice and host of the television show True Crime with Aphrodite Jones. Well, Aphrodite, what else comes to mind? Well, I, you know, first and foremost, let me say that, you know, while there is no forensic evidence to tie this man to this crime you know one of the things you've all talked about here is the csi effect and the fact that juries want to have forensic evidence nowadays um, to tie a a defendant to a crime especially a heinous crime like this um, what concerns me is if this man this violent man um, as he's given a third trial is um is found to be not guilty by a jury. If someone has a doubt on a jury, and of course you don't know if he's going to take a bench trial or, or opt for a bench trial or opt for a jury trial. Uh, if he pleads to the bench, you know, uh, I think that, you know, I think that with two convictions already there, um, you know, the, uh, my my feeling would be that that uh, a judge is going to be less likely to let him out into this society. But you know, who knows? Um, but I think a jury um, could easily have somebody on it who would have a doubt, especially when they're unable to hear um, about his prior convictions, that he, uh, you know, is, is basically a convicted felon walking the streets and a danger to society. And under any circumstances, under no circumstances, do we want someone like that walking around on the streets? However, does it mean that he committed this particular crime. And because there is only circumstantial evidence, which I realize many cases are just circumstantial, but there is nothing physical to tie him to this crime, he could wind up walking the streets again. And I think that on the one hand, that is mortifying if he did this, 
that is mortifying. On the other hand, if he did not do this, and there's a possibility that there's someone out there who got away with murder, who can't be found right now, then, you know, we have a travesty of justice. So, I, you know, I think that's, that's the, the thing that keeps us all in suspense about this case and the thing that people want to get to the bottom of. People want to get to the truth. And, and the truth is this man claims he didn't do it. He may be the worst man on the face of the earth. He's certainly a child molester. He's certainly a, a, an acquitted murderer. And yet, do we know that he, convict, he, he committed this particular murder, this crime? And while it was two different juries that convicted him, my understanding is that there was a bias on these juries, um, that there, one jury had a, a South African person who was a white supremacist and his wife also on the jury. Uh, I, you know, I, I don't know. These were all white juries back in time who were hearing about a black man who uh, had records, had a record, who, who um, you know, allegedly murdered and, and, and burned, a lot, burned this girl. Um, a white girl. A white girl. They, they, you said with a the record. They didn't know that. But yeah. they did hear about this, his, his alleged drug dealing with... Um, no, they didn't. No, in the first trial. that was Okay, why and it was reversed. They okay. did not hear it in the second one. Okay, fair enough. There had been a motion to suppress, and the judge didn't rule that out, and I was foolish enough to think that the appellate court would agree with him, but they didn't. Okay, okay. When you keep saying circumstantial evidence, under Iowa law, and I think Illinois too, I've done a few over here, circumstantial evidence is evidence. They weigh under the every evidence. Law, in every state. Oh, no, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Years ago, when you and I started this business, there used to be a special instruction on just circumstantial evidence. There isn't any longer. It is just evidence. Let me ask you this, um, Aphrodite. Since we're talking about jurors, we're talking about verdicts, and we're talking about evidence, and you've looked at all this evidence that's been presented in the last two trials, if you were sitting on that jury, how do you think you would um, vote? Well, I think that the reason I, I, I bring up this stepfather nicknamed Ace is that I would have a doubt in my mind about his role, participation, and or uh, actual um, having done this deed. And the reason I say that is, is not just because of the leather coat or because he seemed to protest too much about that, but because, more importantly, there were neighbors, and in particular, uh, this man, Arnold Pappas, who later testified uh, that, and described a statement that this man made uh, saying that, you know, Joe Glenn got out in the middle of the street and was standing and screaming, and if I'm going to quote it, you punk-ass motherfuckers don't mean nothing to me. He said that I killed my daughter, and you punks don't mean shit to me. I can kill you too. And that's a quote. So to me, if I'm going to hear that in a trial, and I'm going to start to think a stepfather who may or may not have liked the attention that his wife was giving to this child that was not really his, a man who's a ne'er-do-well uh, of his own accord, uh, not, not necessarily a, a, a criminal, but a druggie, that raises a doubt in my mind as to whether or not this person did have something to do with it. And now, I understand no jury has ever heard about that incident with the neighbor. But was will it be brought into court? That was this it came up in a, in a post-conviction hearing. Yeah, but I, I would assume that the jury that we're going to have coming up will hear about this case. I mean, I'd be shocked if that isn't brought up by the defense. Well, it's got to be a big thing by the defense. That's a huge thing. And it was two people who heard it. It was it was uh, Arnold Pappas and and another woman by the name of uh, Ms. Gomez. But so it wasn't... did not deny saying that or in his recollection it was something like that but Lori Gomez and Arnold Pappas are credible witnesses and if he didn't deny that he stood in the middle of the street on April 7th 1999 and shout I killed my daughter that brings for me as a juror if I were a juror a huge sense of doubt as to whether or not Stanley Liggins is the man Bill you've mentioned to me before that Ace had a tendency to say really stupid things. I mean, is that a... 
that's an understatement. Truly an understatement. I mean, he said he was an extraordinarily frustrating um, uh, witness oh, to work oh, with. Oh, he was, he was terrible. <laughs> Why don't you elaborate a little bit? No, I'm not going to because I'm not, you know, this case has got to be tried over. Uh -huh. Prosecutors aren't real happy that I'm here anyway, and I'm not going to go on the air and tell them, tell the defense how to try their case. Okay. Fair enough. Fair enough. Well, let me ask this question uh, of, of both Mike and uh, Bill. Do you think we'll see justice done in this case um, with, of the upcoming trial? I believe that uh, there's nothing like an American jury to shake out the truth and justice. And I don't know of any reason why it won't happen in this case. How about you, Mike? And my answer would be I don't know. Do you have I a thought? I don't know. Do you have a thought, Aphrodite? I, I think that the outcome of the trial um, has, to, has to play itself out. And, um, you know, there's no doubt that this is a dangerous man. And that, having said that, Stanley Liggins... Um, having been convicted twice, um, there has to be something there to, to make two jurors uh, not, you know, to not just sit here and say, oh, well, they're white supremacists and they're anti-black and they just wanted to pin it on somebody. No, there has to be something there more than uh, one circumstance to have led these juries to convict him. So, you know, we're going to have to let it play out. I can't see it any other way. I do have a question in my mind about the possibility that this uh, Joe Glenn uh, might have had some connection to it. My other question is, why is Joe Glenn, I know he's perhaps a homeless man, I don't think he's dead, why is he not coming out of the woodwork with this podcast and, and, and screaming you know, his innocence to the mountaintops? Why has he disappeared and, and, and nowhere to be found? I don't think Joe's the kind of guy that listens to public radio. But, you know, I mean, Scott went down to New Orleans to go try to find this man. And, I, you know, he actually questioned a bunch of people who thought they recognized him. He now has a beard, whatever, doesn't have a beard. I mean, he has to know from the streets that somebody's looking for him. And if he's so innocent, why doesn't he step forward to profess it? It's just a question. I'm not saying, you know, anything's provable, but it's just a huge question in my mind. And to answer your question, Scott, as to what might happen, if I had that question as, as just an observer, then sitting in the trial could be a juror who's going to have that question. Absolutely, I appreciate that. One thing I point I really want to make is this man had the most competent counsel in this area as defense lawyers in two trials. It wasn't that, uh, you know, he got, quote, the bottom lawyer or the new kid on the block. He got competent, experienced counsel and excellent representation. No, oh, I, I, I don't doubt it for a minute. And I'm sure that I don't think this the case is being argued on the merits of, of counsel, is it? I mean, the, the appeal. Good point. No, Lawyers don't no. win and the fact cases. Is, facts is, do. Uh, I, and I do have to say that I think a lot of the success is uh, to be laid at the feet of Bill as, as a trial lawyer. I, I did the best I could against a case that was troublesome. Well, look, it's a miracle to get a conviction. Stuff like that. It's a miracle to get a conviction with, with such little evidence. And I, I applaud, uh, you know, I applaud you, Bill, for that uh, tremendously. Don't, I do not take away anything from Bill Davis and what he's done here. And do I think that Stanley Liggins belongs on the streets? I absolutely do not. Is he a danger to society? In my opinion, he absolutely is. I am just questioning whether or not a jury is going to, in a third trial, why this man was given a third trial is curious. And a jury who's hearing this with, with some new evidence, may a juror have a doubt. And hence, he may be let go. You're absolutely yeah, right. That's why. A, I think he has a, a better chance with this trial than with either of his first two. Bill, I can tell you why to jump out of your seat to say something, so go ahead. General rule, the state's case gets better the second time or the third time around. I don't know that that'll be the case in this particular thing, as your expert uh, pointed out. There are some things that a, a, a juror is going to pick up on, and if they're handled in such a way that it sticks out and jogs somebody's mind, 
there's problems. This case is, there's all kinds of issues. Most of the witnesses, if you get back to the, your office with all your fingers, you feel good. Crimes like this don't happen at the convent or on the church steps, and we don't have the Monsignor as a witness generally. You talk about the witnesses that we have available and how come their character is questionable, because that's where crimes happen. That's who sees crimes. That's the world. Aphrodite, you, uh, the, the, you know, as the listeners know, I was one of the first people on the scene that night back in 1990. I was a very young reporter. And, you know, I, I can honestly say it's the most horrible thing I've ever seen in my life. You've worked a lot of different crimes over the years. And it, it, you said um, when we were chatting on the phone the other day that this crime reminds you of uh, one that you wrote a book on. Why don't you tell us a little about, about that? Yeah, well... That's one of the reasons I, I think I'm so pumped up about this is because I wrote a book called Cruel Sacrifice in 1992. A 12-year-old girl was beaten, raped, and, and sodomized with a tire iron for nine hours in the trunk of a car and then burned alive on a field in Indiana. And the murderers, the culprits, were three teenage girls. Um, I was at their sentencing hearings. Um, two of the girls got 60 years. One got 50, the one who poured the gas on Shanda Scherer, the 12-year-old. They're, in all, there were, there were four teenage girls driving around in a car with a 12-year-old in the trunk for nine hours. Um, and two of those girls tortured her and beat her. Um, the third girl helped with pouring the gas, gasoline on her, and they burned her alive. The fourth girl actually turned state's evidence and, and, copped, uh, and got a 10-year ten, ten sentence, a reduced sentence for her, her testimony. But really all four girls were uh, ha- somehow a part of this horrible, brutal murder of a 12-year-old child. And unfortunately for me, as Scott had to witness uh, this, this scene, um, I had to witness through photographs a child who uh, looked like uh, she looked like a mannequin that somehow when then you got close in on the face and it was just charred and it was so horrific and it is so horrific and that book Cruel Sacrifice remains to this day 20 something years later um, kind of a, 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 a cult book because I go into the history of these girls and how it was they came to kill this 12-year-old and how four teenage girls ages 15 and 16 could murder and burn alive a 12-year-old girl. And and, and for what? Um, And it it turned out it was supposedly some lesbian love ring, and I don't know how a 12-year-old knows whether she's a lesbian or not, but I don't think this child really knew what she was involved in, clearly didn't have, uh, you know, any life's experience, and and that that case haunts me forever. It's it's just... uh, that is the most horrifying crime I've ever heard of, and this one comes close. I mean, it's it's just senseless. It's it's it could be anyone's grandchild, anyone's child, um, and I think that in both cases, what what strikes me is that the public at large, doesn't even know about these girls or these types of cases. Not that they're an everyday case, by far not, but there are many cases of children who are brutally and savagely murdered, and we don't hear about it because they're not, uh, you know, a JonBenet Ramsey. They're not, you know, a wealthy kid that like a like a J.C. Dugard or a whatever, you know, that we do hear about. And I I think it's it's vital that the public pay attention to what's happening to our children and not not just as victims, but also in the case of cruel sacrifice, children who are killing each other. Um, and I know when I wrote that many years ago, I thought, oh, this is an anomaly. This will never, ever happen again. And, and you know, there's been more teen-on-teen violence in, in recent years than ever before. And Is there anything else um, you'd like to add, Mike, or uh, 
or Aphrodite or Phil? No, I'm fine, thanks. No, I, I really don't have anything to add. Uh, I think Bill knows this, and I bet you to you, Scott, that it, it, this is the case that cost me and my family the most pain in terms of how we were treated in the public and in social situations. It was a, it was a hard case to do. I know and, your predecessor. Uh, your predecessor, Gary McKendrick, who was the defense attorney in the first trial, said it was the only case where he got death threats um, defending. Yeah. Yeah. So. And then in my case, it was not just me, but my wife or daughter were ostracized from any number of summer activities during the trial and shunned and called names and all kinds of things. Okay. okay. Anything you'd like to add, Aphrodite, as we close out? I just, you know, this little girl happens to share the same last name as, as my, my family's last name, Lewis, L-A-W-I-S. And I have to say that, you know, my feelings toward her, while I've never known her and I've only heard about her, is that she deserves the fight for justice. She deserves to know who her killer is, and she deserves the truth. And that is what I'm looking for here. I think that's a, a very noble goal. I will say that. And I don't hate you like I hate Nancy Grace. <laughs> well, that's good. I don't shouldn't be hated because I'm not an I'm not trying to question the law. I'm on the law's side, frankly, in most of what I do. Well, I'd like to try the case again myself, but uh yeah, I'm tired. <laughs> Thank you guys for really being, uh, being on here. I appreciate it. Production support comes from Alfredo Monteca. Big thanks to Colin Thompson and Cast Media for our online presence. And thank you to WBIK CEO Jay Pierce and the WBIK staff. All archived audio was generously provided by WQAD TV Channel 8. Thank you for listening to Suspect Convictions. If you appreciate the work we do, please leave a rating and review it in iTunes to help us get discovered by more people and get the word out about the case of Jennifer Ann Lewis. Go to suspectconvictions.com slash review to find out how to leave a review and get access to case files in exchange. That's suspectconvictions.com slash review.